Scott is now nominally, nominally retired, but you know he can't keep his fingers out of things. So he's still doing a bit of work at the faculty, and he's, uh, I, I guess, involved in uh, work with postgrad students. He's a former uh, uh, faculty director. I don't know what they call those in, in your place, dean or something. Do they call them? Yeah, the department head dean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all that, all that, that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I went yeah. to the dark side for a while. Went to the dark side, climbing the greasy pole, you know. But he gives you a good pension. Uh, but he didn't stop him from doing his work. One of the first papers I ever read in Philosophy of Sport, this is when I hadn't really heard of Philosophy of Sport, despite having been a sports person, despite having trained as a PE teacher, and being interested in philosophy of education, with philosophy of physical education a tiny, tiny part of that, I'd never really heard of philosophy of sport. And in 1973, I read a paper called From Test to Contest, which I'm still quoting uh, today. This is 1975, Scott. I'm not giving away how old you are, very old you are, <laughs> but, but, but he's a bit older than me. <laughs> right. The um, problem is I haven't advanced at all from that paper. <laughs> <laughs> this is another version of Test of Contact. You're still living off it. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> the other thing he's living off is the textbooks. Right. But, but uh, I, I don't know what sort of deal you're on with the publisher. But it, it goes into its nth edition. Practical philosophy of sport is, is a locus. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> locus. Yeah, also show this. this is, History and philosophy of sport, physical activity, climbing, you know, uh, um, well known uh, 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 co authors. History and philosophy of sport, physical activity. This is the latest one, pulling the money in for a poor old retired guy. <laughs> but Practical Philosophy of Sport is a book that I used in my own teaching. I'm sure other people who are teachers here have been consulting the text. Well, Scott, thanks very much for making the trip. We're very pleased to have you here. And without more ado, is going to address us on the topic of seeking gratuitous enjoyment, players, play acts, and playgrounds. Soft questions. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for that short introduction. <laughs> and um, I'm staying with Jim and Arena uh, at their place in Prague. And they're a wonderful host. I uh, had the pleasure of visiting Croatia and Matia last year. So I'm getting to know this part of the world uh, better and better. Steve, why don't you move a little bit so I can see. I like to have eye contact with uh, people who are going to ask me tough questions at the end. And um, I'm delighted to share the keynote podium with Emily, who I've known for a long time. And it's great to see you here. So uh, I'm looking forward to this. Um, this talk is about the good life, uh, but it's going to take me 40 minutes to get there. Uh, the the punchline at the end, so you know where I'm headed, is that the good life is composed of two very di different emotions, hatred and love. And this paper is to try to explain how both of those emotions work into what we might call a good life, or more humbly, uh, one version of a good life. I uh, include Husserl uh, because he spent some time uh, supposedly here in this country, and uh, I was um, taught in graduate school by uh, a well-known Husserlian scholar in the United States. So I studied Husserl uh, when I was um, too young to appreciate uh, what he did. So I'm going to use him a little bit here today. So as Jim mentioned, we're going to be talking about uh, gratuitous enjoyment. And I'm going to try to draw a distinction between two kinds of enjoyment, uh, gratuitous and conditional enjoyment. And that distinction is going to track with the hatred and love that uh, I'm going to talk about near the end. So I'm going to try to make some progress in this talk on a long-standing debate. It's a metaphysical debate over the nature of play, and it's a normative debate uh, about how much or in what ways play contributes to the good life. I'm going to honor Herschel and employ his three-part model for understanding. I don't like to use technical language in general presentations, but you may be familiar with this language of ego, noesis, and noema, 
which is another way of talking about the self, the act, and the object. It's uh, really all that uh, he's talking about here. I'm going to try to show how and why this player, play act, and play object model for consciousness that Husserl championed helps us see more clearly distinctions between play and things that are very much like play. That is, they share some characteristics with play, but most of us metaphysicians would not want to call them play proper. I'm going to support uh, a person who some of you have read, Bernie Suits, uh, with his general thrust and how he tried to define play. I don't like his definition, but I like the fact that he engaged in trying to come up with a, dis a better distinction than voicing a hat. But I'm going to use phenomenological grounds, so I'm going to follow Husserl and Merleau Ponty here in trying to develop a stronger distinction between play and other things that are like play. So the distinction is going to be between something I call gratuitous enjoyment, which will be play proper, in contrast to something I'm going to call contingent enjoyment, which is like play, but I, in terms of nomenclature, would want, not want to call it play. So I'll briefly speculate on the place of both gratuitous and contingent forms of enjoyment on the good life by relying on two people that I've read over the years, many years ago, Hannah Rent, and uh, then the theologian G.K. Chesterton. Jim failed to mention that what I'm doing in retirement is also pastoring a church. So uh, the theology part, I'm not gonna try to proselytize or convert anybody here today. Uh, but I, I do come upon my theological interest, uh, honestly, I guess you could say. So philosophers have argued uh, over the merits of analyses that move in two very different kinds of directions. First toward fixity, foundational intelligibility, the essential and necessary nature of things. The second direction toward variability, contingency, complexity, chaos, and the evolution of things. And this disagreement over the proper direction or purpose of philosophy was actually carried on within the phenomenological movement itself, with Husserl tending toward the former, the fixity, and his disciples and opponents, perhaps his most famous disciple, Merleau-Ponty, tending toward chaos and um, variability. So in this paper, I'm going to suggest this is an unimportant argument, like a lot of them. Like many dualisms, this one distorts, I think, and confuses us more than clarifies and enlightens. In point of fact, I think if you read both Merleau-Ponty and Husserl carefully, they didn't like this dualism either. Husserl came to acknowledge existential variability with his notions of horizons and his turn to the notion of the good life later in his uh, career. And Merleau-Ponty acknowledged the importance of foundational insight albeit more as a starting point than a finishing point. So I'll be talking about play in both senses, as fixed, fixed idea, an essential nature, and as variable. And I'm going to begin this two-sided analysis with the work of Bernie Suits. Many of you, how many of you have read his words on play? So some of you know this, it'll be review, others of you may have not. Suits wasn't a phenomenologist but his motives were very much like those of Husserl. Suits was very metaphysically aggressive, you could say. He was optimistic, in other words, about the power of reason. However, Suits worked more conceptually and analytically than descriptively. He drew attention to conceptual requirements, more so than differential experiences. Suits' basic complaint, as many of you know, was that Husserl Poisinger's definition was too broad. It was too broad, as Suits humorously put this in his paper, because Poisinger was able to find play under nearly every rock in the social landscape. <laughs> Suits claimed that Poisinger had identified but a single criterion for play, namely autotelicity. Thus, play for Poisinger would be any activity in which the end lies in the doing any activity that is experienced as intriguing, interesting, fun, meaningful, or whatever, and needs no further justification. Poisinger suggested that even seemingly serious endeavors, such as combat or duels, activities that clearly had extrinsically important ends, 
can be experienced as utterly fascinating and fully engaging, as ends in themselves, and thus too as play. Suits and the French philosopher Calvin, in addition to a whole number of play critics, objected to this conclusion. They didn't attack Poisinger's empirical assertion that war could be experienced at times and even occasionally autotelically. Rather, they argued for the insufficiency of that criterion. They agreed that play experiences are autotelic, but they insisted that play also must be something else. For suits, that something more or something else was reallocation or more broadly, relationality. Play is the kind of activity that logically stands in relationship to other things. It's like the notion of light, suits argued, which is intelligible, intelligible only in relationship to dark. Similarly, reallocation is intelligible only in relationship to the contrasting phenomenon of allocation. Suits noted that we humans, due to conditions of scarcity, normally and ordinarily allocate our finite amounts of time and energy to various necessities related, related to survival and general well-being. Occasionally, those normal and ordinary and necessary activities can be experienced as more or less enjoyable, thus too as more or less autotelic. However, on Suits' criteria, that would not make them play. Speaking analytically, then, play is not characterized by enjoyment per se, but rather autotelicity under conditions of reallocation. War experiences, even occasionally enjoyable war experiences, cannot be play because no reallocation has taken place. Time and energy are still being fundamentally and primarily allocated to normal, important, extrinsic ends, namely those related to survival. Suits' analysis of play has received a number, many, critical reviews and far less favorable attention than his characterization of games. I'm a contrarian in this regard. I don't like to be a contrarian. I hope that's not my image in the philosophy of sport, but here I'm a contrarian. I think it should be the other way around. As I've argued, his analysis of games is flawed in certain ways, but I think the thrust of his analysis of play is fundamentally sound. My primary complaint is that he did not defend it well enough. His argument would have been stronger had he been a phenomenologist and less an analytic philosopher. I'll try to show why that's the case after a short refresher on a few of Husserl's very important contributions to philosophy in general and thus philosophy of sports specifically. So a little bit of refresher on Husserl for those of you who haven't read him recently. As commonly known, Husserl was influenced by the work of Descartes, particularly by Descartes' scientific spirit, his radical doubt, his efforts to uncover rational grounds for attaining certain knowledge. Husserl, however, believed that Descartes' two-part understanding of consciousness that included only the ego and cogito was unduly limiting. Husserl would follow Brentano's lead in picturing thoughtfulness in terms of three characteristics, and he would add the all-important third element of object, or cogitatum, or noema. In addition, Husserl replaced Descartes' deductive, scholastic-flavored methodology with description based on intuiting or seeing any object of inquiry as it is in fact. Regarding the phenomenon of play, a topic to my knowledge that Husserl never addressed and would leave to his protege, some of you read Eugen Fink, Husserl would have us ask, what makes play intelligible? This is the fixity, the essential kind of an analysis. Through his epoche or reduction, he tried to eliminate all contingent sources of understanding. And he suggested after doing this reduction, we would be able to see a phenomenon 
like play for, in fact, what it is. That is, what makes it a distinctive type of activity uh, and how, why we experience it the way it is. By reflectively adding and subtracting factors to core play characteristics and by noticing the effect of that adding and subtracting, Husserl believed we'd be able to zero in on play's essential nature. A phenomenologist, for example, might add the factor of seriousness, uh, understood or def defined as caring intensely to play to see if play still remained intelligible. That philosopher, after completing the reductions, might then see or intuit the compatibility of play. I'm not arguing that, but the compatibility of play and seriousness. I think it is right, actually. In other words, the addition of intensity or seriousness of intent by the phenomenologist did nothing to compromise the essential nature of play. The necessary conclusion for Husserl would then follow. Play is compatible with attitudes of seriousness. Heusinger was arguably not a good philosopher. How many of you have read Homo Ludens? It's a great book and it's a terrible book. <laughs> Gives me headaches. Uh, Heusinger was somewhat trained in philosophy, uh, but he was not schooled in phenomenology as far as I know. But he came to the same conclusion that we just came to in this little brief analysis of seriousness. As a cultural historian, he had no trouble finding empirical examples of serious play. Thus, by a process of induction, looking at empirical cases where that person's at play and they're very serious, there's another person at play and we can see how serious they are, he came to the same conclusion. Play is or can be serious. So we have two examples, a phenomenologist, a Husserl strike, perhaps an idealist as some people said, and a more empirical person studying play, coalescing on the same fixed identity for play. It can be serious. The nature of play allows that kind of thing. So I mentioned these two methods for coming to identical conclusions to underline the importance of foundational fixity kinds of thinking, of distinguishing one thing from another, even though that singular thing may show up wearing different clothing, looking different ways. For instance, in the case of play, it could be wearing the clothing of seriousness, or it could be wearing the clothing of lightheartedness or frivolity. So whether we believe in a transcendental ego that's able to see objects, absolutely, I don't. Uh, or an empirical ego, ego that can see only more or less confidently, we need to be able, as human beings, to distinguish this from that, the safe from the harmful, chairs from tables, play from work. From a natural standpoint, we count on making these common distinctions accurately in order to function effectively in a shared world. After all, when someone asks you or me to play, we need to know what they're inviting us to do. Husserl felt this need more passionately than many other philosophers. I believe he would have been a staunch opponent of Wittgenstein, perhaps even more rabid adversary than Bernie Suits was. Suits regarded Wittgenstein's famous analysis of play in terms of family resemblances as an abomination. I'm old enough to have been present when Bernie Suits actually gave his talk, Words on Play. I was sitting in the audience as a very young person, not understanding what he was saying. <laughs> he was always entertaining, so I laughed a lot and then later tried to figure out why I was laughing. <laughs> um, so here's what Bernie said at that meeting, quote, when a terminal Wittgensteinian realizes you are seriously trying to define something, he exhibits anxiety and melancholy. And then he calls you bad names, end of quote. Thus, Suits is a public service, and he said that in his talk, actually stopped his presentation for a few seconds to allow any what he called terminal Wittgensteinians to leave the room. <laughs> Well, nobody left the room, even though there were probably a couple of them in attendance. 
So definitions are important, and I would argue that at least a degree of confidence can be put in them. Suits was neither wasting his time nor relying on powers of reason in indefensible ways, I would argue, when he endorsed voicing his claim that play experiences are autotelic and when he went in search of a second criterion, one that would provide an important distinction between what we might call autotelic work on the one hand and fulsome play on the other. His notion of reallocation makes some sense, but I would claim it does not track well with lived experience, and here is why. As Fink and others have observed, we often spontaneously fall into play. The player makes no antecedent decision to reallocate anything. Likewise, during play, the autotelic experience can be fully captivating. We lose track of time. We don't calculate how much more time, in other words, we can uh, afford to reallocate to play. We lose track of our energy stores, and we often play to exhaustion and beyond. I do that myself. We don't calculate how much more energy we're willing to reallocate to play. In short, the notion of reallocation, while it may be logically compelling in some ways, does not describe the lived experience of play in real time, in real space, uh, using real energy. So that's uh, the reason I think we need to go further. So here's where phenomenology in general and Husserl's three-part model for intentionality becomes useful. It helps us in the search for the missing criterion. It helps us see how and why enjoyable work and enjoyable play are distinctive metaphysically, and as I hope to show right at the end of the talk, how they're distinctive normatively as well. So here's Husserl, a little bit of Husserl, and uh, talk about his noema, the third element, the object. This section is entitled The Ambiguity of Playgrounds. Consciousness, as Husserl reminded us, is always consciousness of something. Got that from Brentano. Similarly, when we play, we always play at or with something. Generically, we can call this something a playground. I use this term broadly to include not only physical locations like sandboxes and baseball fields, but any number of projects or undergoings. That would count as a playground too. Phenomenologically speaking, the whole world is not only my oyster, as Shakespeare once wrote, it's a potential playground. It is, not only, it is only potentially such because it's ambiguous. It can be met as useful, it can be met as enjoyable, or some mixture of both. It can be a site for means-directed activity, or a site that is for activity that's an end in itself. Jogging, for example, can be experienced as a means to better health, or as a joy to be relished or perhaps some mixture of the two. No place, no activity, no project, no toy is guaranteed to be encountered as intrinsically interesting. Conversely, virtually any place, virtually any activity, any project could be or could become over time a playground. The reason for this ambiguity in the potential play world is due in part to the play-inducing or play-repelling characteristics of the world itself. What's out there matters to Husserl, and it matters to us who want to find play in our lives. A treadmill, for example, one of my students wrote an article on hating treadmill running. A treadmill invites utility, but for some, it can actually morph into a playground. I don't know many people that have it happen, but I've been told it happens. Conversely, a game of baseball invites serendipity, but for some, it can morph into a workplace. A well-written novel also invites serendipity, but it can be read with an eye fixed on utility, as is the case for some unhappy undergraduates who have to read the novel uh, for their class and be great enough understanding it. The world is play ambiguous for another reason. The object of intentionality may be encountered not only as useful or lovely, 
but also as inviting or off-putting. A lake, if we come upon a lake in the distance, we're jogging up or whatever, has strong potential for inviting play, but probably not for a non-swimmer for whom it would likely generate discomfort or fear. A tennis court can be a most attractive playground, but it might well hold absolutely no interest for a neophyte who has not learned how to hold a racket or hit a ball. Conversely, a metal cooking pot lying on a cold kitchen floor, you have to sort of picture this, a, cook, a metal cooking pot lying on a cold kitchen floor next to a wooden spoon, spoon would hardly serve as an attractive playground, and it would not issue play invitations for most. But they could, and they did, for a one-year-old, as my wife and I learned with our first child, when he delighted in producing ear-splitting music with these two beautiful instruments. We never gave him the pot and the spoon again after that. These reflections on the nature of the world as a potential playground, as ambiguously lovely and useful, as variously inviting and repelling, underline the dynamics of two parts of Husserl's three-part understanding of consciousness. Play requires a fit between the player and the potential playground. Moreover, as Merleau-Ponty would later emphasize, neither one of these two elements is fixed, neither the playground nor the player. Neither one of these is fixed. The ego, the player, is variously play prepared. The world, the noema, is variously play receptive. Play can be and often is rich and enduring when the match is good or becomes good over time. Play is frustrated or short-lived when neither of these conditions is satisfied. Apart from the importance of the dynamic player-playground relationship, we should not lose sight of the fact that the whole world, or at least a good part of the world, and this is important for the end of my paper, can be play-inviting and play-sustaining. The whole world, or at least a good part of it, can be or become a playground. To paraphrase Mark Twain, one cannot throw a rock in any direction and not hit a playground. One only needs to have the play eyes to see and the play ears to hear if one is to experience life of deep recurring play. The journey from youth to adulthood all too often dulls those eyes and stops up those ears. Part of this is natural as we mature and we learn to accept adult responsibilities. However, some of it is not. Many life circumstances, some of them tragic, prevent play-sensitive eyes and play-sensitive ears to develop, and thus render individuals depressed, frightened, cynical, and thus not able to find their playgrounds. However, and this is the important thing for a realist like me, a metaphysical realist, it does not follow that such playgrounds do not exist. These individu individuals simply cannot see them. They are there, but they can't be found. I will have to return to this idea during my concluding theological speculations. Next section is about Husserl's noesis and the idea of complex unified acts. To this point, I've ignored the third element in Husserl's analysis of intentionality the noesis or the play act. I saved the best for last, because it's here that we'll be able to see most clearly how to amend Suit's two-part characterization of play. This location for a solution shouldn't surprise any of us, because many play analyses and an analysts characterize play as a stance, as a way of facing or approaching the world. Drew Hyland did it, Von Schiller did it, a whole number of play theorists did it. These claims about the centrality of cognitive acts are consistent with Husserl's understanding of how consciousness works. Specifically, acts of consciousness color the objects at which they aim. 
In other words, the nature of the act will affect the way we meet the object. For instance, we can direct reflective acts of valuation on the one hand, doubt or wonder toward play. The noesis does not change the world as it would for a closet idealist, but affects how we see it. So we would see the world as valued, as doubted, or as wondered about, depending on which act was directed toward the object of interest. It affects, in other words, the perspective from which we will meet the world. The noesis for Khusro will give us play in many different ways, but it's still play, the thing in itself, to use Husserl's word, that remains under the philosopher's microscope. The play act is not an act of reflection, but it's rather one of embodied engagement. Play requires acts of undergoing, I guess you could say hands-on involvement with the world. It could involve solving the problem of hitting a golf ball or figuring out who done it in a dramatic novel or finding hard to find objects if you're a stamp collector or experiencing the sensuous thrill of rolling down a hillside or observing and contemplating the beauty of a rose. A lot of ways of acting in playful ways. The noetic question is how these acts are to be colored. Will they be colored as useful or lovely? Poisinger's answer was that all such acts must aim at fun. The world is lovely. In play, we aim at enjoyably solving, enjoyably appreciating, enjoyably finding and collecting, enjoyably encountering sensuous fills, thrills, and so on. Form. Of course, this is another way of, to describe autotelic consciousness. It aims at an infinite variety of undergoings simply for the fun of it for the positive affect these undergoings produce, and sometimes for the gratifying meanings they produce as well. So it's no exaggeration to say that the driver of play consciousness is fun, pleasure, or enjoyment. I use a lot of different words there. As Bentham put it, pleasure and pain are our two sovereign masters. Our play responses stand as answers to the call of pleasure or to put it more broadly, the quest for intrinsic satisfaction over extrinsic drudgery. The question is whether or not this quest for intrinsic stops at the boundaries provided by games, sport, sandboxes, novels, music, gardens, and other standard playgrounds and play activities. The answer here, I think, is obvious. It does not. Pleasure seeking follows us throughout our life and into the workplace and into our work. It follows us into many extrinsically driven activities. All things being equal, we want our work to be enjoyable too, at least from time to time. And the same is true for meeting daily necessities. We have to eat to stay alive but we do so by eating our favorite foods. So in both ways, we seek to satisfy the criterion of autotelicity. The pull of intrinsica of autotelicity is so strong, we may take a job we truly enjoy, even though it pays us less. And we may continue to eat chocolate and ice cream, which I do, even knowing they lack certain nutritional value. The philosophic question here is whether or not Enjoyable work and enjoyable eating are play. Suit's answer, of course, again, is negative. It is not, because no fundamental reallocation has taken place in either one. The happy worker uh, is still working and is driven by the extrinsic purposes of that work. At least if they're a worker. <laughs> now, I admit somebody, pe people at work, could be turned into a player and then they'll get fired eventually. <laughs> but uh, as worker, they still have to follow the, the extrinsic muse. The happy diner is still responding to biological necessities and is driven by the need to eat in order to survive. Suits has given us some clues that will help us distinguish two very different kinds of pleasure seeking noetic acts. Both of them aim at enjoyment, 
and both of them would color the world lovely, beautiful, as intrinsically valuable. However, they do that in very different ways. Let's call these two stances acts of gratuitous enjoyment on the one hand and acts of conditional enjoyment on the other. Acts of gratuitous enjoyment aim at enjoyment per se. They are trusting acts. They're giving acts. They don't bargain. They don't carry any caveats. I'm speaking ideally here. These acts are gratuitous because they don't expect anything beyond what is offered by the magic of the playground. In a sense, the gratuitous player is irrational because he or she, at least for periods of time, is blind to utility, blind to prudence, blind to means ends kind of thinking other than those inherent in the play activity. The gratuitous player looks for nothing beyond the joy of reading, the joy of sailing in the ocean, the joy of gardening. The gratuitous player is the fool. And it's interesting that some depictions of players uh, show them as foolish people about to get into big trouble. The gratuitous player is the fool, the one who dances to the play muse apart from promises of utility, apart from any prudential concerns about using scarce resources of time or energy. This, of course, does not prevent extrinsic benefits from accruing to the fool, but they are accidental. They're like icing on the cake, not part of the player's serial acts or <coughs> flow of consciousness in interacting with his or her playground. We know players may be more or less foolish, and play acts may be more or less gratuitously targeted. But the principle here, which is what's important, is clear. The play act is one that aims at gratuitous enjoyment. The play noesis colors the world beautiful, period. An alternative noetic, noetic act is bimodal. Husserl would call it a unified act that has two parts to it, two identifiable elements, and one of them taking precedence over the other. They're not balanced. There's one that's more important than the other, but they both inform the way one meets the world. Within this act, aim that enjoyment, we find an overriding condition, an only if kind of element. These conditions serve as a break on play, a limitation, a constraint, a guardrail, and they emerge from the utility side of our ambiguous world. Let's take an example of a surgeon, someone who's, say, doing brain surgery on you. She loves her job, and on certain occasions, she finds her work intrinsically enjoyable. She tells herself she would do this or something like it, even if she weren't being paid. Indeed, on a given afternoon, she finds herself in rapture while performing a challenging but extremely interesting surgery. If she were at play, she might well unnecessarily extend the surgery because it is so much fun. <laughs> but her conditional only if intentionality requires she not do this. Pleasure seeking for the surgeon extends only so far as the extrinsic commitments will allow. To be sure, sometimes pleasure-seeking and conducting good surgery are compatible. We're hope they're, we hope they're compatible, so surgeons aren't unhappy all the time. But this is a serendipity. We could, I suppose, call this serendipitous play if we wanted to. But I, would, I think that would confuse apples with, and oranges. It would be more accurate to call it enjoyable work in order to acknowledge what it is. That is, primarily an extrinsically driven intentionality that only occasionally, only on serendipitous occasions, provides autotelic experiences similar to those of play. Here are some implications for this. Husserl wanted, you know, he was called a solipsist and an idealist and so forth, and Husserl was sensitive to the fact that if his phenomenology was good, it would track on the real world in important ways. Here's an attempt to show how this kind of distinction between um, gratuitous 
intentionality and so forth makes a difference. I'm using a case of physical education, my home base. So he struggled, Husserl did, with idealism and solipsism. So as against his critics, he argued that his phenomenology would be useful in solving real world problems. For instance, by serving as a foundation for all the empirical sciences, which he argued ad nauseum. Husserl would want us to put our noetic distinctions uh, between acts of gratuitous and conditional enjoyment to a pragmatic test. Can it? And does it do any work in our day-to-day -day lives? I think it does. It certainly does in physical education. It explains why physical education, or PE, has been largely a failure, at least in the United States and perhaps in other countries too. Physical educators could grow playgrounds. They could develop their students' play eyes and play ears in order to allow them to hear and see their playgrounds. They could liberate their students to experience the good life in this particular way, a life of joy, by celebrating and modeling gratuitous play intentionality themselves. But they do not. Too many physical educators fall short on all three elements of Husserl's ego, act, and object. They are not true players. They are not deep players. Or if they were at one time, they have grown far too sober. They are taking their jobs too seriously, and as Chesterton would say, for that reason they're not taking them seriously enough. So I would argue they need to get serious about play. They need to become pedagogical fools. They need to be a Pied Piper of play. Exude the play spirit. Imply to their students that they, the teachers, would much rather be playing themselves than teaching them how to play. I did that, I think, on numerous occasions. In developing their curriculum, every one of these reformed physical educators, or non-reformed physical educators, would say to their kids, we want the kids to have fun. Have you heard that before? PE should be fun. Most of them put conditions on where and how the fun will be pursued. Here's how the fun gets pursued, folks. Safely, real safely. With high heart rates, with sufficient caloric expenditures, and with lots of efficient movement. Efficient, that is, for health promoting purposes. Not much foolishness there. These well-intentioned instructors are inadvertently suppressing play and presenting their students with an unholy pedagogical diet of low-grade fun mixed with low-grade utility. This is what a conditional play noetic perspective produces in our gymnasiums and in our playing fields. It colors the potential play world gray. Players remain underdeveloped. Unbridled, noetic play acts are neither modeled nor practiced. And playgrounds remain, as a result, largely hidden from the view of both instructors and their students. I move to the end here, a brief theology of play. Our metaphysical analysis to this point has identified two species of pleasure-seeking behavior acts aimed at gratuitous enjoyment versus acts aimed at conditional enjoyment. There's probably a third generic type of activity, and it might be called pure duty, pure necessity. Acts of pure duty and necessity present the world as uniformly, not ambiguously useful, uniformly useful and nothing more. Some cultural philosophers have called this labor in contrast to work and play. Hannah Arendt, some of you may have read, uh, is one of them. She argued that labor is, quote, any activity which corresponds to the biological processes of the human body, and thus is encountered in terms of, quote, vital necessities. There's nothing in this activity, according to Arendt's scheme, that speaks to quality of life let alone to the distinctiveness of human life compared to that of infrahuman animals. For Arendt, human value 
the good life, which we're heading toward here, is found in the other two superior categories that she identified. Work is the next one up for uh, a rent. It's an activity that occurs with purpose. It produces things that are distinct from the natural surrounding. It produces chairs, houses, legal systems, codes of conduct. The products of work are designed to outlast the people who produce them. They're designed with an eye toward a better future, making the world better. They're designed to transcend the here and the now. Arendt called her third category action. I wish she had labeled it play, because that's what it really is. This is the domain of freedom. She identified it in a Greek sense as the arena of politics of human interaction. People of leisure could engage in that. While labor and work place constraints or conditions on us, they and while they limit us in terms of what we should do, in the domain of action, we are never conditioned absolutely. We exercise our freedom, if only in degrees. Following Aristotle, she embraced the vita activa, a life that is concerned with, quote, things neither necessary nor merely useful, end quote. That is, with things that are ends in themselves. This three-part understanding of human behavior, labor, work, and uh, action, as she called it, provides a foundation for zeroing in on the good life. It includes categories, the good life does, categories two and three, work and action. It excludes labor. That is so because mere preservation of life does not touch on human uniqueness. Labor honors life, but it says nothing about the good life. Theologically, it portrays us as biological creatures, not humans created with unique duties and unique joys. Or in other words, the words of Genesis, humans created in the image and likeness of God. G.K. Chesterton developed a unique theology of work and play. He believed individuals should be passionate about both of them. That passion is best generated, he believed, by assuming a noetic stance of faith. Not everybody does that, of course. It's faith aimed at redemption, at kingdom living, that he was looking at. From that perspective, from that noetic stance in looking at the world, the evil in the world, the suffering in the world, generates what he called a fiercer discontent. It's that fiercer discontent that should serve as the engine that drives our work. That work will be meaningful, very meaningful, because it's directed toward reformation, toward promoting kingdom living, here and now. This world, Chesterton said, is a task garden full of interesting problems. A stance of conditional enjoyment that I've been describing with an emphasis on the conditional would be compatible with that part of a passionate life devoted to reformation. So I'm going to argue that's one half of good living. The other extreme in the good life generates a fiercer enjoyment. Chesterton wrote, quote, it's not only possible to say a great deal in praise of play, it's really possible to say the highest things in praise of it. Chesterton saw play as providing a foretaste of heaven. Christian doctrine indicates we currently live in a playground, Chesterton believed. He wrote, Catholic doctrine and discipline may be walls, but they are walls of a playground. Christianity is the only frame, I'm still quoting Chesterton, Christianity is the only frame which has reserved the pleasures of paganism. The good life for Chesterton is this. It's a life of alternating passions, a fiercer discontent alternating with a fiercer joy, an unabashed hatred, and an unabashed love. 
while this portrays Christian life as paradoxical, that existence is nonetheless coherent. Why is it coherent? Because both passions aim at life. Both passions affirm life. The good life is a two-sided, passionate life. It is interesting that a noetic stance of faith helps people of faith see the ambiguous world in terms of its extremes, as a task garden and as a playground. The reality of the task garden reinforces the significance of the conditional aspect of our noetic acts aimed at conditional enjoyment. The reality of the playground reinforces the significance of the gratuity in noetic acts aimed at gratuitous enjoyment. These stand then as alternate and compatible ways of living the good life, both of them aimed at intrinsically enjoyable living, each of them resting on very different foundations. Whether these foundations are uncovered from secular thinking or from religious perspectives, neither one of them should ever be confused with the other. Thank you very much. Wow, it's going to take us some time to, uh, uh, to consider the many points made and uh, the way in which Scott managed to draw together this literature. What I suggest now, because we saved a few minutes at the beginning, we now have 20 minutes, and I propose to spend two of those minutes in relaxed activity. So time for Scott to have a breather and a glass of water, and time for you just to shuffle about a bit, have a conversation, and prepare brief questions. <laughs> Two minutes. Right. Are we ready, please, guys? Let's start. Let's bring them in. God, these philosophers. You give them an inch, they take a yard, right? So, good. We've got a good 15 minutes. So we look forward to some conversation. Uh, we start with that, thing, please. Uh, thank you. I, I agree with Jim in the sense that there's so much stuff going on. Um, I'll, I'm trying to have a go at uh, saying something we have two points. Do we have to distinguish between children and adults in this conception of play and good life? Um, I'm thinking particularly in terms of um, adults have an understanding of utility and kind of in terms of what things are for. So children approach the world in very different ways. Yeah, um, a common observation, as you well know, is that children play better than adults. They play all the time, and like the example I use with the pots and the spoon, you can you know, give a child anything. I would say that the same is true with uh, elementary physical education. In a previous life, I used to visit elementary schools and then high schools, like two different worlds. Elementary school, noise, delay, there's a sound that goes with playgrounds. And when I went to elementary schools, it was there. When I went to high schools, silence, you know. Some of the kids in the stands were combing their hair and, you know, they were bored to tears. So, uh, you yeah, know, I think there's a, there's a difference. Uh, I've toyed with the idea of, you know, whether or not children really have the, these kinds of distinctions. And I think they do, but I would say the gradations are different. Children live more in a playground and more in the gratuitous enjoyment that I talk about. But there are certain instinctual things that are there, even with little kids, that have to do with pain responses and so forth to life, fear kinds of things. You can scare a kid, a very little kid. And so they can meet the, the world in other than play terms. But I would say in terms of gradations, we were born to play, and then we grow out of it. <laughs> you know, it'd be more of a social commentary on how play, you know, how it goes. And uh, in a way, it's, it's sad, um, even to get back to theological things, you know, Jesus said, unless people come to me as little children. You can interpret that in a zillion different ways, but one of the ways I like to interpret it in secular terms is, unless you come into life with wonder, at the majesty and the incredible invitations that we have as people to interact with this world, you can't see God, you can't see uh, the divine at all unless you are sensitive to that. And uh, I think one of the saddest things that happens is that we 
we grow away from it, not toward it, as adults. And so I think it's an issue of gradation. You see some, you know, maybe we get back into it. I'm senior adult now. I think I'm playing better now than I did a couple years ago. <laughs> because uh, I'm more like a kid, I think. You know, I don't have to impress anybody. You know, I can just do my thing and ride my bike and have a good time. And, you know, the book's selling well, so. <laughs> so. Yeah, hey, so. Uh, first of all, the presentation got me all excited, not least because you mentioned uh, Hannah Arendt and the Vita Activa, which uh, also stands central in, in my presentation, so I hope my question doesn't reveal too much of, of that part. Um, but I want to respectfully challenge your equation between what ha Hannah Arendt calls action and what you call play. Uh, because while you state that action is not conditioned absolutely, Arendt does say that actually action is conditioned fundamentally by plurality, mm -hmm. by the other. So I guess my question is, to what extent does your understanding of play also incorporate the other? Mm -hmm. And if so, how? And if not, then is this maybe an element where you decide to path ways from on that? Yeah, I think the, uh, how things are conditioned, human life is conditioned. Embodied existence is conditioned. I'm here and now I can't be there and then at the same time. And so there are huge numbers of conditions. Plurality is another condition. I think, you know, we are social animals. We were debating in the train on the way here to what extent we're sort of innately social animals. I think there's a degree in which we are. We need others. Most people do. And there's a, a degree to which we naturally want to associate we flourish better in relationship rather than alone. So I think that kind of conditioning is very compatible with play. <coughs> the conditioning I was concerned about is the necessitated conditioning dealing with prudential concerns in life, you know, to stay alive, to avoid danger and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so I read that third category of a rent as more as we're, we're conditioned but we're not conditioned fatally in terms of our play response to the world. Um, I th she's been, uh, I'll be anxious to see how you interpret her, but she's been called an idealist and, you know, somebody who, uh, you know, goes off too far in that kind of direction. But I think that in degrees, we're never purely as human beings unconditioned by necessity. Standing here right now, I'm conditioned by necessity and I have to be. Uh, but in terms of my existential experience of life, there are times I become foolish in degrees. <laughs> Lucian, I'm very sorry. We, 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 I should have asked you to introduce yourself in case some people don't know who you are. So could, would you do it now? Oh, yes, of course. Pleasure. Um, so yes, hi, everyone. My name is Lucian. I'm a lecturer in uh, University of Greenwich uh, in London. And very new to the community of philosophy of sport. I went to IAPS uh, in Pennsylvania uh, last summer. That was my first kind of, uh, I call it, uh, yeah, where I got to know uh, the community and uh, got to know Lucas who invited me here. So, yeah. And welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Steve, were you on next? Uh, uh, Steve Green from the University of Westminster. Um, I have no philosophy background, so I feel like a first year undergraduate about to be shot and being blamed. But I was really intrigued by the intrinsic, extrinsic, and compulsion. Uh, but I wonder if that's really predicated on a notion of free will, even though I accept what the students are, mm -hmm. but I would sort of say they're exercise of free will. And is there a category of deed in play? And I'm thinking particularly something like pathological gambling. So you're pathological gambler who has an intrinsic motivation and gets rewarded. So you can see their heart rate go up and there is an extrinsic motivation through a potential reward mm -hmm. and some sort of answers your question directly. <clears throat> I think freedom is misanalyzed in terms of play um, because we typically think of freedom as uh, requiring choice. I have A and B and I have the liberty to go A or B if I'm a free person. 
if I'm predisposed or, um, as some materialists argue, required to go be, uh, and I'm faked out about it, I'm really not free. I think uh, play to me exists on a continuum where sometimes deep play paradoxically has the uh, characteristic of unfreedom. That as we get deeper into play, it's more compulsory. Uh, I've got friends who are totally out of control uh, with regard to golf. <laughs> they spend themselves into debtor's prison because they're so compelled. They have to be on the golf course. They play in the dead of winter, and in state college, you don't want to be playing in the dead of winter. They play with orange balls, and uh, they can't find them when they go into snow drifts. Um, <clears throat> but um, as long as it's the love of the game that has attracted them and has gotten them into trouble, their existential experience is not one of freedom. I can pick golf today or not because I'm a free person. So I think it's paradoxical that in fact, some of the lesser players have more consciousness of choice. I could bike today, but I don't really like biking that much. I could gamble today, but I don't really like gambling that much. There might be sort of an, almost a feeling of a more freedom at the lesser end. I like the imagery of foolishness in play. I think that deep players um, can identify with the foolishness of being attracted. And I've used the metaphor of a push or a pull. I think either way, strong playgrounds are like very strong magnets. And I would tell my students in class, you know, I'm standing here talking about Husserl, but right now I'm hearing, bike, bike, get out there, bike, bike, bike. <laughs> That's what's going through my ears right then. And I look at my watch, how much longer do I have to talk about Husserl? <laughs> And so, you know, am I free then or not? Because that damn biking voice keeps coming into my ear. Um, but, so I think freedom is a very, di a, a very difficult thing to analyze in terms of play. There's certainly a sense in which we're free. We're free from common concerns, i.e. necessities, in a certain way, because we forget about them. They're out of mind, out of sight, out of mind. And so you can say, boy, I'm so glad I'm not worried about my ego. I'm not worried about making enough money. I'm not worried about this or that. So you could say there's a sort of a negative freedom from, um, I don't know. That freedom is a very interesting concept relative to play. But I think the existential experience is often one of compulsion. Play grabs you and won't let go sometimes. We're time for one more material. Yeah. Thank you. I have actually two questions, but I think one will be quick. Uh, first, uh, louder. Ah, okay. Uh, first question I have to uh, is about William John Morgan. And what is your explanation why uh, the term or the notion uh, gratuitous actually is a flashback of Morgan's work? Do you have the explanation for that in the, in the sports literature, sports philosophy literature? And the second... No, no, one question first. About Morgan. Oh, Morgan's, yeah. Morgan's so, interpretation of... No, no, I, I wonder uh, why uh, we in the sports philosophy literature are connecting uh, the notion of gratuitous mostly to Morgan's work. Why is this his flash badge, as I call it? How would you what answer what that? His signature. Yeah, what's signature, Morgan's signature? Yeah, yeah. who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you can understand it, I, I think I understand it. Yeah, Morgan is, um, I would call more of a cultural uh, philosopher, anti-idealist, and that, uh, you know, he sees um, sport as being variable and culturally influenced. And um, so, you know, his big argument is against the Intern broad internalists who he, uh, I think, calls um, secret idealists in a sense. They've smuggled in some essentialistic characteristics of what sport has to be. In some ways, I'm with Morgan. Uh, you know, I'm a little bit ambivalent because half of my paper was we need to know what things are and there's a certain fixity to them. 
And so I don't want to go with Morgan into a cultural relativism and say, well, sport in this country is this and sport in that country. One of my first papers I gave was at the 1972 Munich Olympics, and this person from Russia stood up and said, after I did a, a poor job of defining sport, and he stood up and said, that is not sport. <laughs> but, you know, well, okay, that's a fairly head-on collision there. <laughs> well, I, and my response was, what do you take sport to be? And he described something totally different than what I had described. And I said, you know, my second question is, how important is it that you own the word sport for that phenomenon? Well, he didn't know how to answer that question. We were talking about two different things. And I said, you know, if you want the word sport, you can have it. <laughs> a cheap giveaway. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a, I'm a metaphysician to an extent more than Bill is. Um, but I certainly am also a Merleau-Pontian enough to know that play is so diverse that it wears so many different clothing, you know, pieces of clothing. Um, and Husserl was like that too, you know, he said you can't, you never come to the end of phenomenology. <laughs> you keep trying new acts toward play, and you see new things, and you see new things. So I would say I'm more of a, an epistemological pluralist. Uh, I want to say a humble metaphysician, because I, I don't get it all. Uh, I get pieces of it, and I try to get more of it all the time. Uh, but I'm not a relativist. Nor a Marxist, by the look of it. No, I'm definitely not a Marxist. <laughs> Thanks very much, Scott. Thank you.